What is a taboo? Are there taboos in religion? Surely, yes. And in science? Surely, no. <laughs> Why would taboos be interesting to talk about? A taboo is a strong social prohibition relating to any area of human activity or social custom that is declared to be sacred and thus forbidden to be discussed in public. And the key is, it's a public thing. Taboos only exist in public. Breaking a taboo is considered objectionable if you're lucky and dangerous if you're not lucky. The word comes from the Tongan language and appears in many Polynesian cultures. And in those cultures, it's mostly associated with religious prohibitions. It was first used in English by Captain James Cook in 1777. The word taboo actually has two opposite meanings. One meaning refers to something that is sacred or consecrated, and the other to things that are impure, dangerous, or disgusting. The intermixing of two forceful opposites in the same word provides the power of the taboo, and the combination is emotional dynamite. The taboo is usually thought to exist only in indigenous, primitive, or unsophisticated cultures. But of course, in every culture, including our own, there are lots of things that we're not supposed to do in public and things we're not supposed to say in public. So these are both taboo acts and taboo words that are closely related to each other. In this talk tonight, don't worry, because I'm not going to do any taboo acts. <laughs> but I should warn you that I will be using some taboo words. Well, how do taboo words manifest in practice? One example is that Orthodox Jews will not write or say the word for God. In parts of West Africa, the word for snake is taboo and can't be spoken in public. In Muslim nations today, any perceived disrespect of the Prophet Muhammad will cause riots, threats of violence, and actual violence. And in an amazing turn of events, which I think is probably unprecedented, the Pope recently had to repeatedly apologize for violating this taboo. Well, since you can't speak taboo words by definition without getting into trouble, if you attempt to, discuss, to study them or to discuss them even, you will face consequences. If you're in academia and you don't have tenure, then you won't get it. It's that simple. If you have tenure, they'll try to take it away from you. This sounds like overkill given the noble principles of academic freedom to which most universities subscribe but the power of violating a taboo cannot be underestimated. So I'm going to give you an example. There is a taboo word that is more commonly used than mom, baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, or Chevrolet, or actually pick your favorite car. It permeates the movies, it permeates television programs, and even a large, a large segment of popular music. Our president uses it. Even the vice president has used it in public. The popular movie, What the Bleep Do We Know, substituted the word bleep in place of this taboo word, which was part of the original title. Can anyone guess which word I'm referring to? <laughs> guess? See? It's a taboo word. Nobody even wants to say it. So let's consider taboos in science. I'll propose that there are three kinds of scientific taboos. I call them transitory taboos, stubborn taboos, and double secret super taboos. Or for short, I'll just call it the woo-woo taboo. <laughs> transitory taboos include stem cell research based on cells taken from human embryos. You get in trouble if you talk too much about this. Or human cloning, or the plan B conception, contraception pill, or discussions about intelligent design. Other taboos include the poo taboo, which refers to inhibitions about discussing what to do with human waste. It turns out that around the world, about one billion people use flush toilets that are connected to sewage systems, which keep the, the water system pure. But 2.8 billion people use pit toilets, and 2.4 billion people don't even have pits. So this is a real global sanitation crisis, as much of a crisis as practically any of the other crises you can imagine, that nobody wants to talk about. How often do you hear this, this story being reported? Till I looked at this, I hadn't even thought of it. But the poo taboo is a, is a real problem. Another scientific taboo. 
There are many such taboos. It's impossible to seriously discuss, at least in public, the possibility that there are any real differences between the races or the genders. For example, the president of Harvard University, Larry Summers, was forced to resign earlier this year after suggesting that women were underrepresented in science engineering because of differences in intrinsic aptitude. That was unacceptable to say. Even though people will talk about it in private, you can't say it in public. Another taboo is that it's virtually impossible to question the causal relationship between HIV and AIDS without being ridiculed or dismissed as a crackpot. The fact is there are some scientists with good credentials who do doubt the standard story about the HIV AIDS relationship, but you're not likely to hear much about it uh, in the scientific literature. It's considered at this point a kind of a dogma and a, and a taboo. Well, why do I call these transitory debu taboos? The answer is because these are controversies that won't last forever. Consider, for example, in vitro fertilization or organ transplants or vaccinations. At one time, these were considered extremely controversial to the point of being tab such a taboo that many scientists would not talk about it in public for fear of lo losing their job. Or consider in earlier times the use of limes to prevent scurvy among British sailors or the practice of washing one's hands before surgery or assisting in childbirth. These two were considered laughable by some and were ridiculed by most at the time. But the controversies eventually passed away and the taboos also dissolved along with them. The next category is stubborn taboos. These refer to scientific controversies that persist for very long periods of time and are resisted with the same vigor that the Parents Television Council uses to promote their views. The resistance comes out of the fact that these concepts challenge the, uh, the, the scientific dogma of the day, and scientific dogma tends to become entrenched and then lasts for a long time. They include the topics of homeopathy, cold fusion, UFO studies, cryptozoology, which are things like searching for a Sasquatch or searching for a Loch Ness Monster, and the so-called free energy machines. For a long time in the, West, in the West, acupuncture was also considered a stubborn taboo, but with the rise of psychoneuroimmunology as a recognized discipline, it has became, it became an ordinary taboo. And now even that status is fading away because it's covered by insurance. <laughs> the concept of chi is also no longer a super taboo because it can be reframed as a sort of bioelectromagnetic phenomenon, which fits more comfortably within the existing scientific worldview. It actually doesn't matter if it's bioelectromagnetic at all, but it can be talked about in those terms. The third category of scientific taboo is the one I'm most interested in. These are the woo-woo taboos. Three that come to mind are alchemy, astrology, and psychic phenomena. For alchemy, I'm not talking about the cartoon version of alchemy, such as turning lead into gold, but rather the study of the boundaries between mind and matter, which is the origins of alchemy, and also the transformation of matter into spirit. For astrology, I'm not talking about newspaper horoscopes, but the notion of cosmic relationships with human behavior, the ideas that Rick Tarnas has studied in great detail. And for psychic phenomena, I don't mean Madame Zodiac, and nor do I mean magicians who masquerade as, magic as psychics, but the scientific study of exceptional human experiences that we've labeled telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, and so on. The woo-woo taboos are very interesting, not only because they evoke the same sort of emotional response as any other taboo topic, but because these topics live right smack in the boundaries between mind and matter. Most of the discussions that you'll hear about science and spirit or science and religion will not touch the topics of alchemy, astrology, or psychic phenomena because they are taboo not just for science, but for religion as well, as, as a double t taboo. Well, how do we know that they're taboo? Because if you take a surveys conducted around the world, we know that consistently 50 to 60% of the general population, including college professors, believe in the possibility or certainty of these phenomena. Nearly 100% of the population general population enjoys TV shows and movies that feature psychic components. Shows like Medium, Lost, Charmed, X-Files, and Supernatural, and movies like The Green Mile, Ghost, Powder, Phenomenon, Star Wars, Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, on and on. So take this massive popular interest and compare it now to another statistic. According to the International Association of Universities, there are 17,760 institutions of higher learning around the world. 
Of those, about 30, which is 0.2%, have faculty who are known for their interest in psychic phenomena. That means that 99.8% of all universities are completely ignoring a topic that is of persistent interest to the vast majority of the population. That's so shocking that I have to repeat it. 99.8% of universities worldwide completely ignore a topic that is of interest to practically the entire world's population. Well, how can that be? So what is this particular taboo? It can be traced to the culture of science, in which it is widely assumed, at least publicly, that concepts of spirituality and religion are completely irrational and have nothing to offer to science. Or worse, the ideas are harmful to science and must be vigorously resisted. Harold Wallace is, or Wallach is a well-known researcher in complementary and alternative medicine at the University of Northampton in England. He wrote that, quote, in mainstream scientific circles, this topic, alternative and complementary medicine, has even had a quasi-obscene touch until very recently and still has in more traditionalist scientific circles. Now, that's just alternative and complementary medicine. Okay, we're talking about something even further than that, so you can imagine how some scientists have a visceral reaction to psychic phenomena. The effects of this taboo can be seen very clearly in the 2005 annual report of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. The back cover shows three icons of science, Isaac Newton, Thomas Edison, and Marie Curie. They're famous for many contributions, including development of a theory of gravity, inventions including the light bulb, and understanding radioactivity. But Newton, as we all know, or some of us know, spent the majority of his career working on alchemy. And Edison spent a majority of his time developing instruments to communicate with the dead, and Marie, Marie Curie attended seances. The woo-woo taboo prevents the AAAS from publicly acknowledging this, or perhaps even from realizing that our very icons of science were also vitally interested in woo-woo topics. Things are slowly changing between science and spirituality, and you can even find a few academic centers that are devoted to this dialogue. But by contrast, you will not find a single academic center anywhere in the world that is devoted to studying the interface between science, spirituality, and psychic phenomena. And add in alchemy and astrology as well. There's not one academic center. Well, why not? Alan Wallace has written, despite centuries of modern philosophical and scientific research into the nature of mind, at present there is no technology that can detect the presence or absence of any kind of consciousness. For scientists don't even know what they're supposed to measure. Strictly speaking, at present, there is no scientific evidence even for the existence of consciousness. All the direct evidence we have consists of non-scientific, first-person accounts of being conscious. <laughs> so what happens when we listen to the data of first-person accounts of consciousness, which are in turn based on a legacy of a couple thousand years of disciplined and skilled observation? We find documents like the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Within the sutras, we find in the third book, the Vibhuti Pada, talks about the cities or the powers associated with the practice of deep exploration of inner space. We find that with pr sufficient practice and ability, the yogi will comprehend past, present, and future as an integrated whole. We'll gain knowledge of previous lives. We'll perceive another person's mind. We'll gain knowledge that is normally unperceivable. And we'll find that these powers are obstacles to the highest spiritual realization, but will serve as magical powers in the objective world. Most scientists regard these magical tales as stories of bygone, unsophisticated days long before modern science brought skepticism and critical thinking into high art forms. But not all scientists have adopted that assumption, and those who have studied the cities in the laboratory have found that some of them can be verified under rigorously controlled conditions. Apparently, the cities do exist, just like Patanjali said they did a thousand years ago or more. This, by the way, is at least for the cities that we've been able to study in the laboratory. There are many that have not. So to paraphrase Bono, this ought to be really, really fucking interesting. <laughs> and yet, it remains an unspoken secret within and outside of science. It's a case of a taboo in action. Thank you.